I, I would like to welcome you to our fourth Master Gardener uh, Gardening Wednesday night class sessions. Tonight is Growing Vegetables and Small Fruit with Roseanne Laparco. She's been a member of the Master Gardener program since 2000. And she also um, brings much experience uh, with her. Um, she worked at George's, a local greenhouse nursery. And she also has worked at Bonai. And presently, she's our Master Gardener Education Committee Chair. And I would like to, or I'd let you know, we are recording this session. And also, um, you will be getting a survey at the, after the class is over via your email. And we are giving away vegetable seeds um, to people who complete the survey and put your mailing address on there and we'll mail them out to you. And uh, Roseanne? Thanks, Holly, and thanks to everybody for joining us tonight. Um, one other uh, announcement I want to make is that you will receive uh, copies of my slides, um, which has a lot of, there are a lot of links embedded in my presentation, but uh, give us a day or two, but you will get copies of these slides. Um, so let's start by, you know, imagining it's 1943. Um, that was a time where more than 20 million Americans stepped up to the plate and decided to grow edible crops. Um, they felt that that was the best way they could contribute to the war effort. That's where the term victory garden came from. Um, it's not 1943 today, obviously, but a lot of the principles and the things that they use to develop Victory Garden still applies today. And with us all being in these extraordinary times we're facing uh, right now, um, the Victory Garden concept is definitely alive and well. And so hopefully tonight, I'm going to inspire you, hopefully, to want to grow your own Victory Garden. Um, and the, the, the benefits of growing your own food, I think, are fairly obvious, but there's other benefits. It's fun to do, number one. It's a great thing to do with the kids or the grandkids. Um, you can think of many ways that uh, growing a vegetable garden has applications to science and math. And so hopefully tonight I give you the foundation of what you can do. Um, and, and kind of, uh, you know, imply about how easy it is to actually grow your own crops. So getting started, these are the things that I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, my focus is going to be no space, no problem. I, I want to create the impression that you don't need a big space to grow your own vegetables and fruits. Uh, we're going to really focus on small uh, areas that you can manage, such as raised beds. I am a big container vegetable garden grower, so we're going to have a little focus on containers. And everything I talk about tonight will apply to any vegetable and small fruit, such as your melons. Uh, but I want to have a, a, a focus at the end on some perennial small fruits. So I put together what I call small fruit fast facts. So at the end of the presentation, we're going to talk about three small fruits, strawberries, uh, brambles, which is a term that encompasses your raspberries, your blackberries, your gooseberries, and then the third one will be, will be uh, blueberries. If I said blueberries, I meant to say uh, blackberries. So you've got uh, strawberries, brambles, and blueberries. And then I've loaded this presentation with a lot of places to go for help. This is a really good time since you can't plant yet. This is a good time to do a little research. I've got some uh, links to videos that'll show you how to build a raised bed. I have some links to some other videos that'll tell you how to plant. And so the presentation is really loaded on things of, and places of where you can go for help. So let's get started with the way 
that you can lay out your garden. That's probably the first thing you have to think about. How are you going to grow your vegetables? Where are you going to grow them? We're probably all used to the traditional layout option. This is your big space where your similar crops are planted in rows. Um, this is probably not for the beginner. Um, the bigger your garden space, the more work there's going to be. Uh, but this is obviously the more traditional way, as the name implies. Um, one of the things I want you to notice from this photograph are the pathways that are in between the, the different crops. That's fairly obvious in a traditional design, but you still have to allow for that accessibility. You got to be able to get to your crops. And so accessibility is a key point. It's easy to see in a traditional design, but you're going to have to think about that even when you do raised beds uh, as to how you can access your vegetables without stepping on them or stepping around them because you don't want to compact the soil and impact the root systems. A layout option that may not be as familiar is what they call an edible landscape. There isn't a rule that says you have to have a separate space for a vegetable garden. So you can literally um, pop some vegetables within your landscape itself. When you look at this photograph, you can, you know, obviously see the cabbages, but also embedded in there are some lettuce plants in the back of the photograph. Back up here in the corner, you'll see some squashes in there. So an edible landscape is essentially says you could put vegetables pretty much anywhere. But then we get into the raised beds, which are the most popular way to grow edible crops. Um, a specialized type of raised bed is referred to as square foot gardening. It was coined by the gentleman you see in the top of my slide, Mel Bartholomew. He has a series of books called Square Foot Gardening. It's a pretty interesting concept. Um, his concept is essentially designing a raised bed, as you can see in the photograph, that's sized four feet by four feet and then including grids that are one foot square around. So essentially having 16 different squares and in each square, there will be certain numbers of vegetables. His concept is in this kind of space, four by four, you can essentially grow the same, same amount of crops you would grow in a space that's in a garden in the ground space that's eight feet by 10 feet. So it's an interesting concept. I've tried it. It's pretty nice. I would um, do a little more research if you think you might be interested. If you just Google square foot gardening, there's all sorts of uh, information about it. And then just picking up or maybe seeing if you can get it virtually at your public library, Mel Bartholomew's book on square foot. Um, your traditional raised beds look a little bit more like this. This might be a little bit of a higher one uh, than you normally would see. We're going to spend a little time on raised beds in general uh, as a separate part of my presentation. But notice a couple things. The watering uh, uh, hoses that are in the beds and then notice that accessibility again in between the raised beds. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about raised beds separately. Now another type of raised bed is referred to as straw bale gardening. This is a new trend, this is pretty hot. Um, a lot of people are doing this. Um, I, I'm not gonna talk about it specifically in this presentation, but I have a link to a great fact sheet from Washington State University Extension to show you how to do straw bale gardening. There's a little bit of prep time that's involved in getting the straw bales ready uh, to plant. And you can also not only plant in the inside, as this picture portrays, but you can actually put crops and make holes in the bales and so you can grow more things. Obviously, this isn't a permanent way. You're not gonna, the straw bales aren't gonna last forever. You, you're definitely gonna get a season out of them, maybe two. And then you can compost, the idea is you can compost the straw bales uh, when they're, when they're uh, decomposed, starting to break away and decompose. 
and then start all over again. But if you're interested, I have a fact sheet. And then last but not least, we're gonna spend a little time with uh, growing your edible crops in yeah. containers. This is my favorite way to do it. This is the way I uh, grow my vegetables. Mm, and as the picture portrays, um, you don't need to get anything fancy as a container. Uh, as you take a look mm. at these storage totes uh, used as vegetable containers. So we'll talk about that in a little more detail later on. So the next thing, uh, obviously you gotta start out with a plan. Once you've decided on the layout you're gonna use, you have to have a plan and when you're talking uh, a plan for a vegetable or an edible garden i like to look at it in terms of the three s's the site you're going to use the sunlight and the soil um is a be if, you, if you're a beginner or you want to just grow a few crops i think it's always a great idea to start slow the traditional in the ground garden for example may not be the best for you so perhaps one raised bed or a couple of containers. So start slow. You wanna make sure you can access it easily. You personally being able to access it easily, but then you wanna be able to get to those plants easily without compressing or compacting the soil. So access is important. You're gonna hear me talk about edible crops and, and watering them. Um, Edible crops are not like growing flowers. If you forget to water your flower garden or a potted uh, flower plant, you can water them later and usually they'll, they'll recoup and they'll come back for you. That's not the case for vegetables. Vegetables will become stressed and they don't bounce back if you forget to water them. Um, if for any, they won't produce as much and they become, once they become stressed like that, um, your quantity of fruits is going to be limited, but worse, you're going to invite yourself uh, to a disease or an insect problem. So you want it to be close to a water source. We'll talk about the different ways to water later in the presentation. And then where you put it, where you put the vegetable garden will be important. Don't put it in a windy spot because that'll let the soil dry out fast and avoid a slope for obvious reasons. You'll have a runoff problem. Sunlight will be critical for growing edibles. You want at least six hours of sunlight. Your leafy crops can tolerate four hours, uh, but there are no vegetables or crops that will tolerate less than four hours. Unfortunately, you can't grow edibles in the shade. I'm gonna talk about sunlight and some ways you can position your plants to maximize the use of light because one of the mistakes that a beginner uh, will make is they'll forget about how tall a plant will get and then you've inadvertently created shade for a plant that's right next to it. But I'm gonna talk about that later. That involves how you position your plants. And then you have to have good soil to have good results um, start out with a good quality uh, topsoil, and then you want to add organic matter. Organic matter can be in the form of some peat moss. Your best option is some compost, or you can actually use manure. Um, one point about manure is you want to make sure if you're going to use that in addition to your topsoil, you want to allow at least two or three weeks, two weeks is probably enough, three would be better before you actually plant because you wanna work it in to the topsoil. And that actually pertains to compost as well. In fact, with the weather the way it is, it's really a good time to get the soil ready. It doesn't matter that you don't have plants yet. Get that soil ready. And you're gonna to wanna to, you know, work it in, till it in, get it ready. You can actually, now's a good time when you mix that soil together. If you're not a compost or manure uh, user, um, you can add an organic fertilizer uh, now, like a slow release, work it in and it'll be ready for when you plant. Um, typical mix, to make it simple, it's probably a half and half mix, like a half topsoil, half organic matter, so half topsoil with half um, compost is a good mix. Um, and then consider a pH test. Um, 
Most vegetables and fruits like cantaloupes or watermelons are not fussy about their pH. They prefer to have a neutral soil. But as we'll talk about at the end of the presentation, some of your berries like raspberries, blackberries, and especially blueberries, they prefer acidic soil. And so if your pH is off, um, you won't get the best yield. And just as a review, you know, what is pH? pH is a measure of the soil's acidity or the soil's alkalinity. And what it measures is the soil's ability to absorb nutrients. So if your pH is off, you could be fertilizing all you want and you could be adding all the amendments you want. If your pH is off, the plants can't take it in. And so you're still not going to have a good yield. So that's why it's really a good idea uh, to do a pH test. And I think if, if some of you join one of my earlier presentations, I talked about how you could start a bed from scratch, taking a little bit of a shortcut. It's tough to cut sod from scratch, even if you're going to put a raised bed on top of it. So what you can do is take about eight to 10 layers of newspaper, or you can use cardboard, wet it down really good, and then put all your good soil on top of it. And what'll happen is that cardboard and newspaper will break down the sod. And so it'll be a lot quicker way to get your bed started. Now, optimally, it would be best if you did this in the fall, because by then, by the spring, the newspaper and cardboard is completely broken down. Um, but there's nothing to say that you can't do it now. It's just that you could still invite some weed issues um, from because you're going to have to cut through that newspaper or cardboard to put your plants in. But it's just a thought to throw out there um, as a simple way to get a bed started versus digging it all out if you aren't physically able to do that. And so let's talk about raised beds for a minute. I want to start by talking about the pros and cons of having a, a raised bed. Um, the pros are fairly obvious. I mean, the big one, you know, the big benefit is you could control the soil a lot better than you could control in the ground. Um, one that might not be as obvious uh, of a benefit is, believe it or not, a raised bed, the soil warms up faster, so you can plant a lot quicker or earlier than you would in a traditional bed. Uh, but they do have some um, cons. Uh, probably one of the big one, uh, biggest one uh, is the watering. Raised beds will dry out a lot faster than a traditional garden. And so you need to be aware of that. And so it's probably a good idea, you know, to consider if you're gonna go the raised bed route, to try to have some kind of reliable watering system, whether it be soaker hoses, or in this picture, if you can see at the bottom, I believe this is probably some form of micro irrigation, which is can be a little pricey. Uh, soaker hoses can do the job just as well. And that way you'll be able to regularly um, water the bed because it's, it's gonna be important. They dry out quickly. The other disadvantage of a raised bed involves your big vining crops. You know, if you grow zucchini or, or cantaloupes in a traditional garden space, you give them room to sprawl. You don't have room to sprawl in a raised bed. So that means you've got to consider something vertical. So you've got to consider what kind of support are you going to put in your raised bed because growing up is going to be very important when you're using raised beds. You could come up with, you know, you could spend a lot of money on your vertical uh, uh, supports or you could get creative and make some. And I'm, I'm going to give you a link in a minute to a video that uh, shows you some, some really uh, good ways that you can make some supports uh, with material you probably have around the house. One of the things you want to make sure you remember as you create this support is the support has to be heavy enough to support whatever you're growing. So, you know, if you're growing cantaloupes or you're growing small watermelons, 
that needs to be a strong enough support so that it'll be able to hold the weight of the fruit. So you need to think about that. Now with raised beds, another thing you need to think about is this accessibility. This particular picture, I think these, the paths between the raised beds are a little narrow. So think about, you're gonna, this is where you're gonna work. So you need to have enough space where you yourself can work because you don't wanna have a raised bed where you're walking in the bed. So you're gonna be working on these pathways. So they need to be wide enough and theoretically, I would want it wide enough so that you could get a wheelbarrow through there. And so this might be just a little bit um, narrow um, for my taste. I probably would have made it a little bit wider. But think about that as you're just deciding, if, especially if you're going to have more than one uh, raised bed. And as we talk about raised beds, uh, you know, this last slide on raised beds, I'm gonna draw your attention to this video. It's great. Um, it's from the University of Maryland Extension. Um, it'll show you the different types of raised beds you can make um, and how to make them, even using some recycled material around your house. And then let me just mention, you know, a couple of last points about raised beds. First of all, the material for the frame itself. It's probably easier to say what you shouldn't use than what you can use. You should not use treated lumber, because remember, these are edible crops that are in here, so you don't want anything toxic. So avoid uh, treated lumber and avoid railroad ties. Railroad ties sometimes uh, have creosalt included, and that's another toxic material, so don't use railroad ties. Typically, Cedar, redwood, cypress, plastic. Uh, in fact, you could see kits for raised beds all over the place now. Those are probably your, your best materials, but you can also use rocks, um, cement blocks. In fact, this video will show you some cement block uh, built raised beds. Um, you can also recycle things like bamboo poles strung together to form a raised bed. Uh, remember the accessibility issue, the vertical support. You might want to consider lining your beds, uh, especially if, if critters are a problem, if you have a problem with woodchucks or even chipmunks, sometimes squirrels getting underneath the bed. Then before you fill your bed with soil, consider using a liner. You can use chicken wire. Um, there's hardware cloth out there, but you might want to line the beds first, uh, so that'll help you with uh, burrowing critters. Um, the, the height of the bed is not as important as the width. Probably a good standard height would be anywhere from six to eight inches. That's a good size for a height. You can go as tall as you want. Just remember the taller that you go, that there's gonna to have to be more soil in there. But if you have a physical limitation, the taller is going to be better, so you don't have to bend down all the time. Just be careful of the width, because remember, you wanna be able to access the crops inside that raised bed without stepping in the bed and compressing the soil. So if you're a beginner or you want to start raised beds for the first time, I think four feet by eight feet is a, is a nice size or three by six is a nice size. And then use, you know, typically go the six or eight inches tall. That'll give you a really good raised bed. So now you want to plan out the space. Um, and, you know, you're going to start planting. So the first thing is put your light crops together. So put your tomatoes in one spot or your lettuces in one spot. There aren't too many perennial vegetables. The two that come to my mind, for example, are rhubarb and asparagus. Typically, you know, put them in one place. I would probably consider a separate bed for your perennials. If you had the, if I had the option or you had the option, I would go separate with your perennials. Um, your small fruits like your strawberries or blueberries or raspberries or perennials, you may want to put them in a separate raised bed as well. But the point is, is keep your perennials isolated from your annual crops. And your plant placement, here's where the sunlight um, factors in there. Um, 
you want to make sure you don't inadvertently cause your tall plants to shade out your other crops. So, you know, when you plant everything together, they're nice little cute little plants. And you don't imagine that that tomato is going to end up being almost as big as a person. And so if you have a smaller crop next to it, you've actually created shade and that plant is not going to do well. So this is a good time to go outside and take a look at your sunlight. Sunlight changes. It changes direction uh, based on the season. Uh, when your trees leaf out, that affects the sunlight. But try to get an idea of the directions of your yard, you know, north, south, east, west. Because if you can get a general idea of those directions, then the best approach is to put your taller crops on the north side, your medium crops in the middle, and then your short crops on the south side. This is going to maximize all the sunlight for all the different sized vegetable crops you put into whatever garden space you use, whether it's traditional or raised bed. And if you, you don't know where to start, think about a theme garden. I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna show you an example of a theme garden on the next slide. And then succession planting is another idea if you have a small space. What succession planting is, is take advantage of using the same holes for different crops. So for example, your lettuces, which will do well in the cool season and then start to bolt when the temperatures get warmer. Well, have your lettuce crop in. When the lettuce crop's maxed out, use those same holes and put a short season pepper in there. Um, that way you're, you're maximizing space and you're, and you're constantly getting something growing uh, in the space. Requires a little bit of thought, but think about it. And if you want to hear more about succession planting, if you Google that, you'll get a lot of information uh, on that concept. And so when you, you decide what to plant, ask yourself these four questions. I think the big one is how much time do you have? The bigger your garden space is going to be, the more time you're going to need to dedicate to it. Vegetable gardening, unfortunately, is not maintenance free. I wish I could tell you that you put your vegetables in and poof, you have your crop. Unfortunately, that's not how it works. So the bigger uh, the space you have, the more time you're going to need to invest in it. So think about that. And then I like to say, think about what you like. So let's say, for example, you love salsa and you love making your own salsa. Here's an example of that theme garden I was talking about. Here's an example of a salsa garden. In a very small space, you have all of the plants you need to grow to make salsa. Uh, you could do this, you can create a pizza garden. Um, obviously, you don't grow the pizza dough, but you could grow your, all you, what you need to make your pizza sauce, uh, what your favorite toppings might be. Um, you can, the sky's the limit for coming up with a theme and then picking your plants around the theme. This is not a nice family-oriented way to, to vegetable garden too, so think on it. Um, and, and I think you can have a lot of fun with it. Now, another thing that you can need to keep in mind when you think about, um, you know, what, what is it that you want to plant when you get your seeds or you go and look at your transplants or, or, or um, you're starting your plants from seed, these are some of the terms that you might encounter and they're important. So I thought I would just quickly go over them. If you see a, a, a vegetable uh, that's a hybrid, don't be scared by that term. A hybrid is essentially a cross between two existing types of uh, that vegetable. So it's not anything scary, it's just a cross between two varieties. Heirlooms are a lot of fun. Uh, heirloom varieties uh, have, are, are plants that have survived the test of time. They're usually very different. I'm sure you've probably gone to a farmer's market and you've seen the purple Cherokee tomatoes or the purple carrots. The heirlooms look different. They're older plants, but they're a lot of fun to grow and they're, they're, they're interesting to add, to think about adding to your uh, vegetable garden. All America Selection, AAS, this society 
does extensive tests on vegetable and fruit varieties. And when a variety gets the AAS award, that is a huge, big deal. And you'll see a lot of plants out there. In fact, a lot of the nurseries like to feature AAS winners as choices. Um, you'll know they went through a vigorous set of tests. There are seeds that are marked as AAS winners. So those are tried and true tested varieties you might want to consider. The term bush is essentially a good term to look for if you're growing in a smaller space. Uh, like a raised bed or a container. Bush varieties grow smaller, so they're more suited for a smaller space. Determinate and indeterminate are key terms if you're growing tomatoes. A determinate tomato is a smaller tomato, more uh, not the fruit, but the plant. It's more designed for a small space. Uh, determinate tomatoes will have their fruit, it'll fruit earlier and they'll get their fruit all at one time. Um, or maybe just a short uh, couple of intervals of a bursts of fruit, uh, but they're more des designed for smaller spaces versus indeterminate. These are your big, big vining tomatoes. They fruit later, um, but when they start fruiting, they fruit all the way till frost. And these are usually the ones that need a lot of support. There's nothing that says you can't grow them in a smaller space, but when you buy a tomato, decide if you want determinate or indeterminate because maybe you don't want a huge plant in your garden. So I wanted to point those two terms out to you. Days to germination, if you use seeds, you'll see this information on the seed packet. It essentially means when you'll start to see the seeds sprout. And then days to harvest, or what's commonly referred to as the uh, maturity time. You'll see this a lot on seed packets, and you'll see on this plant tag on my slide, it has a maturity time of 76 days. That is really important for our area because we don't have a long growing season. So the longer that maturity date is, the longer it's going to take for that plant to produce the fruit because the number of days, uh, what that means is from the time you put the transplant in the ground, in this example, it's going to take 76 days before you begin to see fruits. Now that varies, give or take, and it varies due to the climate and the weather. But this is why a tomato that grows in Georgia, for example, is probably not your best choice to grow up here because we have a lot shorter growing season than Georgia has. So make sure you pay attention to that um, days to harvest uh, time frame. So should you start with seeds or should you start with plants? This is just generally speaking. I mean, everybody has their own um, success or failures that they've tried either way. But generally speaking, the plants in the seeded column, you can actually put these seeds directly into the ground. Um, your root crops, uh, those are considered your carrots, your radishes, or your potatoes. Your coal crops are your broccolis or your cabbages. These are crops that you know tend to like cooler temperatures. They do perfectly well going direct seeded in the ground. Your transplanted column, these are ones that need warm weather to get their uh, act together, so to speak. So you either want to you, you want to start with plants. You'll have more success starting with plants, whether you start your seeds indoors and then transplant or you actually go out and buy plants. But the bottom line is your center column, prefer, you'll have more success because it's preferred that you plant plants versus seeds directly in the ground. And then your leafy crops and your vines, which is anything from your cantaloupes to your zucchinis or your cucumbers, you could do either way. They, you know, they'll do well direct seeded or they'll do well with transplants. And like I said, this is just a general um, idea to get you going, especially if you're a beginner with this. And when to plant, um, we typically like to say vegetables can be divided into two groups. They either like it hot or they like it cold. Um, this warm season list, these are the plants that you don't wanna be in a hurry to plant. 
it's still way too cold to plant any of these. These are the, the warm season column. These are the plants where you want temperatures, even at night, to not go below 50 degrees. So you want to see consistent at least 50 degrees at night. The soil needs to be at least 50 degrees. So you do not want to be in a hurry to plant those. Your cool season, on the other hand, these plants actually like it a little bit cold. And in fact, some of them will even tolerate a light frost, like your coal crops. They actually will, will tolerate a little frost and, and they, they may even taste better if they get a little frost. Um, I've got some great, uh, there's a great handout that I'll point you to at the end of the presentation that you can get online that will give you guidelines as to the best times to plant these two groups of plants. Uh, but just keep in mind, I, I think I want to especially drive home the warm season column because we're all anxious, we want to get out there. These are the ones you just can't be in a hurry to plant. And then these are the ones where you have to be concerned about that maturity date. You don't want to pick a variety that takes forever to fruit because our growing season, once it's warm, it's going to be pretty short. So that's another reason why you want to look at that information. Some quick planting tips, whether you start your seeds indoors and you have transplants, or you go to the nursery and buy plants, you wanna make sure they get hardened off. What that means is, is don't plant them right away. Put them in the shade for a few days so they can get acclimated to outdoors. Even greenhouse grown plants, they're in greenhouse light. It's a totally different light than outside. So make sure you take your transplants and harden them off. In terms of how to plant, I, I like to talk about this in terms of seeds. Pay attention to your seed packet. Most of the time, you're probably going to have to thin out. And thinning out means is some of uh, the seedlings will have to be pulled out because it's very important that you space your plants uh, the right way and in the recommended spacing in between. So with seeds, if you scatter them, they're gonna be all, the seedlings are gonna all be tightly compressed in there and you're gonna to wanna to thin something out, thin some of them, excuse me, out, so that you make sure that the ones you leave are gonna be the strongest ones and they're spaced out correctly. So just look at your seed packet, they'll tell you how to do that. Um, trenching, this is something unique to tomatoes. Look at the photograph at the bottom of the slide. Tomato plants can actually be planted sideways. Uh, this pertains to when you get transplants that are a little leggy. You know, you've probably seen tomato plants in a six pack where they're, they're huge. You can actually tip them over, plant them on their side. Uh, you would pull all the bottom leaves off and leave two sets of leaves and you could see that little mounding of the soil that tomato plant will then sprout straight up and it'll be stronger for it. It'll be a stronger plant because of it. Tomatoes are one of those unique plants, and it's only for tomatoes, by the way, where you can literally plant these deep and you could take those leaves right off the bottom. They're a vining plant, and so they actually appreciate growing that way. And then don't forget your plant support. Don't wait until the plant gets big to put your support in, whether you use cages or you make your own support. Put the support in as you're planting, and that way you don't make the mistake of forgetting about it. And that even applies to when you grow them in containers, which we'll talk about in a second. I want to mention bare roots for a second, because if you grow, want to grow strawberries or your brambles or blueberries, a very cost-effective way to buy them is by buying them in a bare root. And spring is the perfect time to plant bare roots of those crops. They don't look like very much. They, in fact, they almost look like they're dead. That picture on the right side is actually raspberries. Um, they're cost-friendly because a, a bare root is a plant in its dormant stage. So on the left side, you'll see an example of uh, bare root strawberries. Bare roots are usually packed in straw like these strawberries are. Sometimes they're packed in 
uh, wood chips or sawdust or even uh, peanuts. Um, there's a unique way to plant these, and so I wanted to just bring it up real quick. They're meant to be planted as soon as you get them or as soon as you purchase them. So the first thing you want to do is hydrate the, the dormant roots. So let them sit in a pail for a couple hours uh, so that they can hydrate. And what's different about planting them is the center photograph. You're not digging a hole per se. You're literally spreading the bare roots on a mound of soil. And then you're backfilling to make sure the crown is level with the soil. So just a unique way to plant these. And if you're on a budget and you wanna grow strawberries or raspberries or blueberries, the bare root is probably your, your most cost-effective option than versus buying plants that are already started. Um, cultural controls, now once you get your, your garden bed planted, these are the things you need to think about and you need to practice. This is what's going to help you if you practice good cultural controls, chances are you won't invite any pests or problems to your garden. So obviously you want to keep the garden clean, weed regularly, um, keep your tools clean. If, if you listen to a previous presentation I gave, I talked about that if you handle a diseased plant with some clippers or your gloves, you can actually transmit the disease to another plant. So after you've been you know, gardening for a while, clean your plants, wipe them down, uh, change out your gloves on a regular basis. Um, we, we already talked about paying attention to spacing, watering. I can't stress that enough. I think I've, I've mentioned it two or three times already tonight. Vegetables cannot handle um, not being watered. They will not recuperate very well. They're not like flowers. And so consider uh, soaker hoses or some kind of irrigation. I know maybe you don't have the, the, the privilege of being able to do that. Um, if you do overhead watering, it's not the best choice, um, only because what overhead watering does is it keeps your, the foliage wet. And what you wanna try to do is minimize wet foliage, because wet foliage is the ticket to disease. And so if you can avoid overhead watering, that's great. If, you, if that's your only option, then do your watering very early in the day so that at least during the day, the plants have a chance to dry up, the water has a chance to evaporate. Just don't forget overhead watering, you tend to forget that, you know, because you've hit the plant with water doesn't mean you watered the roots. So just make sure that you're watering the roots if you do have to do overhead watering. We haven't talked about fertilizer much. I mentioned uh, the slow release. Um, typically, you know, some, some vegetables are heavier feed, feeders than others, but if you wanted um, a standard uh, fertilizer, fertilizer recommendation is start out with the slow release, and the slow release you can put in when you're getting your soil ready. I like to recommend that you don't put the fertilizer in as you're putting your plants in. Um, the plants are gonna go through transplant shock as it is. So wait about a week until the plants are established before you start an actual fertilizer regimen. But if you get your, your slow release into your soil now before your plant, before you plant, you're, you're good, you're good to go. Um, and then you may want to consider, you know, in the ground and raised beds, some kind of water-based uh, fertilizer, maybe once a month. You will fertilize more in containers, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but I have some fact sheets, again, that will give you some recommendations for fertilizing. Obviously, if you're a compost user, that's going to be your ticket. You're, you're going to, you're going to, fertilize your plants in the long term by using compost. Uh, mulching, your vegetable beds should be mulched. Straw makes a nice uh, mulch cover. It helps to retain moisture. Um, anything natural, you can use leaves, you can use small uh, wood uh, uh, pellets. 
Um, you can also use compost as a top dressing to also serve as a mulch cover. Uh, we talked about the vertical growing. Um, look out there for resistant varieties because, for example, tomatoes, we all know they're prone to blight problems, but there are a lot of varieties now that have been bred to resist the blight. Um, Cornell has a list of resistant varieties, and so I'll make sure that you, at the end of the presentation, you'll have the link to look at uh, Cornell's list. And then, obviously, we're going to have to talk about pest management. So I have some integrated pest management ideas uh, because, obviously, we don't want to spray um, our crops, our edible crops, with anything unless we absolutely have to. Um, I won't talk about the spraying because we're all going to have success. I'm hopefully going to give you the tips so that you won't have to do anything. So let's just talk about pests for a little bit. Um, I wish I had the magic formula as to what's the best way to keep pests out, especially like animals. Exclusion is going to be your best technique. You could get very creative with how you exclude animals. This picture is from Mel Bartholomew's Square Foot Gardening uh, book, where you can actually make, um, you know, almost in turn, you know, for lack of another word, a little mesh cover so the animals can't get to your crops. Exclusion is obviously going to be your best bet, whether you fence it in, um, enclose it somehow. Um, but that can you can also be creative in how you exclude animals from your containers. Um, nothing like trying to reach for your tomato because this is my number one thing and a chipmunk's left his teeth marks in a tomato. That's always, you know, a wonderful thing. So here's an idea for something you could do around your tomato cage. It's just simple screening material to keep an animal out. Um, for insects, there are sticky traps that you can hang throughout the garden. Um, some of when you put your young transplants in the garden and all of a sudden you turn around and they've disappeared chances are you you might have a cutworm problem cutworms absolutely love to just chop off the transplant so you could make little little barrier cups like this paper cup which would prevent um, a, a cutworm from getting to your transplants um, I do have the, you know, Cornell website will show you some other ideas of what you can do for natural pest control. Unfortunately, with growing fruits like strawberries or raspberries, birds and animals will probably be your biggest problem. There is netting you can purchase um, to cover your plants so that the birds can't get to your berries. Um, this is an example of a raised bed with blueberries in it, and you could create a, a kind of a hoop approach with some chicken wire so that the birds and the animals won't get to your berries. Um, the Maryland website that I referred to earlier talks about this a little bit and how to actually make the hoops. This one might make your neighbors think you're crazy, but it can work. Um, birds and animals um, get a little funny if they see unusual objects, or in the case of these pie plates, um, they'll reflect the sunlight as they move around in the wind, and that could be just enough to spook the birds from leaving your fruits alone, leaving your, your vegetables alone. Um, I know people that use uh, old CDs and just hang them from the plants because the CDs move around in the wind, they reflect the light. Um, you know, you could just let your neighbors know you're not crazy. You can also hang even something simple like aluminum foil strips because they, again, they re the idea is they reflect the light, they move around, and they could potentially spook the animals. There are also animal repellents out there. I haven't had a lot of success with them because just like we want, we'll do what it takes to get food, animals will do what it takes to get food. But if you do want to try them, just make sure you read the label to make sure that you can use the repellent on edible crops because some of them you can't. Many of the ones that you can use on edible crops, like this particular one, are based with hot peppers. 
Um, hot peppers is also another natural option that a lot of animals don't like. So you could consider either making your own hot pepper repellent or sometimes putting down hot pepper uh, flakes will deter an animal. Uh, but animals are tough. I'm here to tell you I don't have the perfect answer. Exclusion ends up being your best bet. And here's another example of blueberries in a raised bed um, with a homemade, um, almost like a, a chicken wire chain around them uh, so that the animals can't get to the berries. Uh, crop rotation is another form of integrated pest management. It's another way you can naturally grow to, to keep pests away. The concept is, is that you move your crops around every year and that you never plant the same thing in the same place year to year. It's a three-year three cycle. Um, the science behind it is that certain crop families do certain things to the soil. They attract certain problems and you can almost fake those problems out by moving your crops around. Some of us don't have the benefit or the space to be able to practice this, but I mentioned it because it's a way, um, if you do have multiple beds, you really should move your crops around. And the diagram shows you the three-year approach. You know, the corn is planted in one place in year one, you move it over to the other side in year two, and then you move it in the middle uh, in year three. Companion planting. This isn't a science-based way to control pests, but I think it's a, I think it works. Um, it's essentially giving your vegetable a buddy, uh, a good buddy or a good friend that will attract beneficial insects that will uh, then attack the bad insects of the other plant. Um, so for example, basil and tomatoes make great friends. The basil will attract beneficials that will naturally attack the insects that are problems for the tomato. The thing with companion planting is plants in the same family are not good friends. So your cabbages and your cauliflower, for example, they're in the same plant family. So they don't make very good companions. They're both going to attract the same problems and in fact, if you plant them together, chances are you could have a problem with an infestation because they're both going to attract uh, the same set of problems. Probably the best example of companion planting is what a lot of us learned in school, the Three Sisters Garden. This is the classic. It's three plants planted together that literally help each other to grow better. Um, and we're probably more familiar with companion flowers. This is why um, marigolds are planted in, in edible beds because marigolds make good companions to generally all edible crops because marigolds will attract the beneficials that will help you naturally control insect problems. So I want to talk a, a second about growing plants in containers because there's a little unique aspect about growing them in containers. This is what I do. I love it. Um, I, I, I want to talk about the three things that are different. Soil, fertilizer, and water. Your soil, you don't want to use garden soil or topsoil. It's too heavy. So you want to look at potting soil or potting mix. And you can mix in compost, just don't mix in more than half, uh, but you want your soil to be light. Because you're going to be watering so much, you need to fertilize regularly, probably every week or every other week, uh, because watering is going to be your biggest challenge. Containers will dry out in a second. In fact, on a hot summer day, you may have to water twice because containers will dry out fast. And I mentioned before about um, the vegetables can't recuperate if they dry out. So just keep those three things in mind. You want to start with a clean container, obviously, uh, but the type and size can vary. Um, I'm here to tell you that a five gallon bucket is a perfect container for just about every vegetable you want to grow. It's the perfect size. 
They're relatively inexpensive. Um, they make great containers. If you don't like what they look like, there is paint you can buy to make them look pretty and funky. Um, it might be a nice project for the kids to uh, paint a, a, a gallon bucket. Um, smaller containers like can, can grow smaller crops. So for example, a flower box is the perfect size for lettuce uh, or spinach. So you're, you don't need a big container um, to grow crops. I think the best thing I can tell you is the bigger the plant, the bigger the container but using the five gallon is probably a good um, gauge of most of your standard vegetables. Don't forget the support. Get it in there before you plant. I love this picture. Um, you can, there's nothing that says you can't grow a cantaloupe in a container, but a cantaloupe is gonna be pretty heavy. And so this is an example of why you want to make sure whatever support you use, even if it's in a container, it's got to be heavy enough to support the fruit. I like this picture because here's an example of, a, of an innovative idea of just using some fabric strips. This happens to be a t-shirt that's been ripped apart and, and tied to the support and it's holding up the fruit so that the fruit doesn't drop off before it's ready to be picked. Um, and you know, they don't call it a strawberry jar for nothing. Uh, you can grow the strawberries, the brambles, or the blueberries in containers. There's a couple of unique things I wanna bring up if you decide to do that. Um, and they are making varieties of raspberries and blueberries and blackberries that are specifically designed for containers, so you can grow just about everything. If you wanna start out for the first time, remember, look for those words that say bush, because they're smaller, determinate, because they're smaller tomatoes, patio is another common word, um, or dwarf. Those are smaller plants, good for the beginner. Um, this is the way I grow them, uh, self-watering containers, if you're not, known for watering on a regular basis, um, self-watering is probably the way to go. Uh, that picture in the center is an earth box. I got one as a gift and I I actually bought another one. I have not turned back since I, I got one. I love it. Um, this concept of a, of a self-watering container is portrayed here on the uh, left side here. The key to a self-watering container is this, this wicking. Your soil and the water never come in contact with one another. It gets wicked up into the soil and into the root system by keeping this water reservoir full. And you literally fill a pipe, and on the earth box, it's here. The water reservoir continuously fills. When it's completely full, there's an over flow hole, and when that starts to overflow, you know you have, uh, the, the water reservoir has stayed full. Um, great concept, because I can keep my watering can right next to the container. I keep that reservoir full, I know I'm good to go. Um, you never have to worry about over or under watering in a container. Um, earth boxes, I, I won't lie to you, I got it as a gift and then when I went to buy another one, I was shocked how expensive they are. There is a way you can actually turn your five gallon bucket or if you use storage totes into a self-watering and I have the link uh, that walks you through the directions step by step on how to do this. There are other ideas. Pallets make great containers uh, for lettuce crops or cabbage. We talked about the storage totes. Uh, remember, whatever you use, in case I didn't mention it, you got to make sure there's drainage holes. So if you do use the storage tote approach or the five gallon bucket, you've got to drill those drainage holes. If I didn't say that, I apologize. And be creative. Here's an example of the old fashioned shoe container. Uh, with some herbs and lettuce in it. You can use a lot of things around the house as a container. Uh, grow bags are popular. I've tried them. I will tell you that they're nice in terms of, you know, at the end of the season, you can store them easily because they collapse down and fold. 
but always keep in mind the bigger the bag, the heavier they are. They're very difficult to move around. One point about tomatoes in containers, go deep. Uh, remember I talked about trenching in the ground. If you grow them in containers, plant them deep, especially if it's a leggy transplant. You can see how deep this one is in the container. Just take the bottom sets of leaves right off and that tomato will grow fine. Um, you can grow fruits in containers. Fruits are, your, are perennials, so you're, you, they come back every year. Um, containers, you can't leave them outside and, and expect them to, have, to come back every year. They're just not going to. So if you decide to, that you want to grow fruits like strawberries or blueberries or raspberries in a container, you've got to worry about the winter protection or they really won't come back for you. They won't survive our winters. So you can either bury them or trench them. This picture buries them, trenching. You could put them the container on their side and then insulate the container with straw or mulch. Uh, or what I like to do is just bring them in. And you can bring them into an unheated storage shed or an unheated garage. You may have to water them during the winter. Um, what you're protecting them from is all the moisture from snow melt and the fr frost freeze variations if you left the container outside. So there's just a little bit of extra work involved if you do decide to grow those fruits outside. And as I wind down, I promised you I was going to do the fast facts for strawberries, brambles, and blueberries. Um, these are the fast facts. What I've underlined are the things that you need to know if you want to grow these. If you want to grow strawberries, you need to be aware that there's four different types. If you're doing it in the ground, it doesn't matter which type you, you, you grow. If you want to do containers, then I would focus on either ever-bearing strawberries or alpine. Uh, your June-bearing uh, plants have runners. They look like this. And wherever they, the runner drops, another strawberry plant starts. And so you need room for these to spread. And so that's why they're probably not a good choice for a container. Strawberries need absolutely good drainage. And they're self-fertile. We didn't talk about pollination in this presentation. So let me just quickly just throw that out there. Any crop that fruits, you got to make sure it, it, it's got it's, it's going to need pollination. So I never like to plant just one vegetable, for example. I always like to have at least a couple so it, there's a pollinator partner. But some plants don't necessarily need a pollinator partner. And so that's what's called self-fertile. So strawberries are one of those. But you want, if you have flowering plants in your yard, then chances are you're going to have the bees in your yard anyway. But, you know, when you're planting edibles, try to, try to do it in twos so that you have at least a couple. But strawberries happen to be self-fertile. Your brambles, um, you can grow these in containers. There are varieties that are specially designed for containers. They're thornless and they don't produce canes. Uh, but traditionally, your raspberries, your blackberries, they're going to produce canes. And if I, I probably should have put three underlines in my presentation. You need to isolate these from other plants because they're vigorous. Their root systems shoot out suckers. And you, you could start with one raspberry plant and in a blink of an eye have a whole bunch of them. And if they're near your landscape plants, you're going to have a difficult time getting those berries out of there. So this is a perfect picture. The raspberries are together. Raspberries prefer uh, slightly acidic soil. Blackberries, you need to have two partners. And you need to provide these plants support because their canes need to be trained to grow up. And there, are, there is regular pruning with these that you have to be concerned about. And then last, uh, blueberries. Two basic varieties, high or low. Uh, the low bush varieties are specially designed for containers. Uh, so you can grow them in containers. You know, any fruit you grow in containers, you're not going to get as much yield, but they'll be enough for you to enjoy for sure. Um, this is a variety called Top Hat. 
top hat is um, designed to be more to look like a landscape plant. It can actually fit in with landscape, very attractive, has a good yield. What I've underlined, blueberries have to have absolute acidic soil. So this is where the pH test comes in. And you must have two different varieties. They need a, part, a cross pot, pollinator partner in order to produce fruit. And blueberries cannot tolerate drought, so they need a regular supply of moisture. And then patience is a virtue when growing blueberries. It can take several years before they actually produce their fruit. There are some varieties that are designed to fruit earlier, but just be patient. So I covered a lot of material tonight. I, I hope you got something out of this presentation. I think I, I'd like to mention if you want to grow fruit, I would invest in a good fruit book. Um, they do have some uniqueness that I may not have covered tonight. Um, I've got a couple suggestions in my reference slide of good fruit books that are worth uh, investing in. And I want to draw your attention to our sister county up in Jefferson. They just posted an absolutely fantastic uh, document on growing a modern victory garden. Um, if you, if you want to look at it now, just Google CCE of Jefferson County Victory Garden and it'll pop up. You can download it to your computer. Everything I covered tonight is in this document, including the Cornell vegetable variety list. Um, I think it's a great way to start your research um, into how you're going to approach putting edibles in your yard this year. So highly recommend it. And then last, go to Cornell's website uh, for the public. They just launched Just Plant It New York. Uh, the website is there. Um, you'll see it, uh, gardening, cows uh, Cornell edu. You'll see the fact sheets, they've got several, but what I really like to draw attention to is they've got two 40 minute videos and they're literally establishing the garden, walking you through it, building it. You'll love the videos. It's gonna snow this weekend. It's a good time to, to check them out. And then pay attention to our local Oneida County, book, County uh, website and our Facebook page. You know, we currently don't have when we're going to do this, but, you know, we are still planning on participating in this year's vegetable variety trial for Cornell, where we're literally going to try some vegetable seeds that are being uh, given to us by Harris Seeds in Rochester. And so hopefully we'll be able to invite you into the gardens at some point or maybe have some future videos where you could see how we did in our own vegetable garden. So pay attention to our Facebook page because that's where we'll post when we'll be doing this and our website. And then I have all your references for you that I talked about tonight. Um, so I apologize for going a little longer tonight, but hopefully you'll find it worth your while. Um, I've also got resources for you uh, to look at. I talked about that making self-watering containers reference. So it's all here. And, and like I said before, you will get copies of, our, of the slides so that you can um, look at these at your leisure. So with that, we'll take a look at any questions you might have. And Holly, if you want to chime in here. Okay. Um, thank you, Roseanne. Um, yes, we do have a question. Are there any resources for pH testing? We just started this week um, testing soil pH. We have a staff, uh, Linda Wimmer, she's going to be testing it them twice a week. Um, there's a big cooler out in our front entrance and the forms are there. Just make sure you put your soil sample in a baggie and label it properly and then you can get the forms, fill them out right up there and drop them in. And let's see, are there any other questions that you would like to put in chat? 
And, and, if, and if you, you know, don't feel comfortable or can't think of a question right now, there's our two email addresses. You know, I'll leave that up for a few minutes. Please don't hesitate to email either one of us and we'll do our best um, to get back to you uh, right away and try to answer your questions, you know, um, on this or any other topic you might think of. Yeah, yeah, thank well, you. And thank you, Terry, for also answering questions in the chat during the lecture. Terry Harrison is Master Gardener volunteer. Could you mention thank you, Mark? Rosie. Uh, I have a question. Uh, if I would like to get some soil tested, where can I send it to, or where can I bring it to? Oh, okay. You for a nutrient analysis? Yes. Okay. Dairy One in Ithaca um, is testing, and it's for a nominal fee. And we do have the forms and boxes right up in a big cooler in the front of our office entrance, or you can pull it off if you have a computer. With a printer, just go to Dairy One and you'll go to their soil sampling and you'll find the forms listed right there. If you need any okay. guidance, just um, feel free to email us. All I needed was the address. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Uh, may I make a comment? Yes. Shredded leaves. If you've got uh, access to leaves that are from an un you know, unfertilized, unpesticide lawn, get them and find a way to shred them and keep them for the next year. That's what I do every year. And then of course cover the, no more than two inches, cover everything. Yes, yes, they, they, they make a nice amendment to the soil. Oh, absolutely, this is Roseanne. I mean, there we use them a lot in, in our regular gardens at the extension. So yeah, I, I can't say enough about using leaves. They naturally decompose and you're doing all sorts of good things for your garden when you use them. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us. And we are planning to do um, some additional classes coming up and we, to keep posted, look on our Facebook site and also on our website. And we will be posting those dates in the next week or two with some new Wednesday night classes. Thank you everybody for, for joining us, I uh, appreciate it, and happy gardening, and get out there and grow some edible crops. Roseanne. Well, grow your own victory garden. Roseanne. Yes. It's Linda Wimmer. One last thing everybody, I see there was a question on viewing this again. I will uh, upload this to our YouTube channel tomorrow, and probably you can either Google it, or the easiest way to find it is go to cceonida.com, Go down to the bottom where you see the YouTube symbol and hit it, and you'll be able to go over, and we'll, we're going to be able to watch Miss Rosanna Dana Dana all over again. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Linda. Oh, just great. Just great. <laughs> Me on YouTube. Just a wonderful thing. Okay. Thank Good you. Good night, everybody. Night.